If you listen to some, including the current Republican nominee for president, Donald Trump, voter fraud is so rampant that if he loses this election, fraud can be the only reason why. While this is infantile and as ridiculous a claim as the other racist, sexist, and bigoted nonsense he spewed for months, unfortunately, there are far too many people buying into this. Bernie Sanders supporters, myself included, bought into the same line when Bernie lost the nomination to Hillary. Media spun stories of voter fraud in places where really what happened was incompetence and just plain stupidity. Unfortunately, people are all too willing to believe collusion over ignorance, and so the conspiracy mindset goes into play. Voter fraud has been made into an issue since almost the founding of this country and an excuse to take away people's rights to vote. The irony of this is frankly astounding, but the fact is that when a population is lied to and made to believe that voter fraud is going on, most of the time this actually means that they are being made to give up their voter rights in one fashion or another. The lies are spun by politicians who are playing them for their own advantage, and all of us are the ones who lose. Let's look at a quote from a book called The Road to Seneca Falls by Judith Wellman. She is talking about women's suffrage, but brings up how voter fraud was actually used to disenfranchise women who originally had the right to vote back in 1776 when this country was first founded. Quote, Voting was a central attribute of full citizenship. Since the Constitution left the requirements for voting in the hands of the states, it was at the state level that challenges to the exclusion of women from the formal political process first reached the level of debate. During the Revolution itself, most state governments failed to deal with the issue. For its new state constitution in 1777, for example, New York adopted its colonial constitution virtually intact, granting the franchise only to propertied males. New Jersey was an exception. There, the 1776 constitution gave voting rights to all inhabitants of this colony of full age who are worth 50 pounds proclamation money clear estate and who had lived in the same county for 12 months prior to the election. All inhabitants included women, both African-American and European-American. Legislative acts in 1790 and 1797 referred to voters as he or she, and women voted regularly in local, state, and national elections. In 1807, however, the legislature used the occasion of widespread fraud in one local election to exclude women from voting. At the same time, they virtually eliminated property qualifications for adult white males." End quote. This, of course, set a pattern for the rest of the states and set a precedent that would continue to this day. Voter fraud is a very specific thing. It is when an individual casts a ballot they know they are ineligible to do in a deliberate attempt to defraud the election system. The statistical fact is that it is more likely that an individual will be struck by lightning than that he will impersonate another voter at the polls. Voter fraud is a popular meme because it gives an out for those who have lost and their followers to say, hey, we didn't really lose, and satisfies our psychological need to be right, no matter what the facts say. It also makes for lurid and fascinating headlines since all of us have come to accept that our political system is rigged. It's all a big fraud anyway, and we don't really have anything we can do about it. But that is exactly the attitude that those who hold their own personal power over their civic duty want you to have. Just think about it for a second. I'm not ranting on in some conspiracy theory about crooked politicians versus citizens. Now, this is Common Sense 101. If you were the kind of person who had power and influence over others, and you wanted to keep it that way, and you held an elected office where voting was how you stay in power, 
than influencing voters to simply not show up to vote at all would be the best way for you to remain the incumbent. What's more, we have a craving for bad news, intrigue, and controversy. What, you think news media feed us a regular diet of bad news and horror stories because we don't like it? <laughs> no, not at all. A great number of us feed on bad news like vampires and allegations of corruption and wrongdoing on the part of our elected officials feeds our human need to hate those who have more power than we do. Here's a quote about this from a 2007 report on voter fraud by the Brennan Center for Justice, a nonprofit activist and think tank group at the New York University School of Law. Quote, perhaps because these stories are dramatic, voter fraud makes a popular scapegoat. In the aftermath of a close election, losing candidates are often quick to blame voter fraud for the results. Legislators cite voter fraud as justification for various new restrictions on the exercise of the franchise. And pundits trot out the same few anecdotes time and again as proof that a wave of fraud is imminent. Allegations of widespread voter fraud, however, often prove greatly exaggerated. It is easy to grab headlines with a lurid claim, tens of thousands may be voting illegally. The follow-up, when any exists, is not usually deemed newsworthy. Yet on closer examination, many of the claims of voter fraud amount to a great deal of smoke without much fire. The allegations simply do not pan out. These inflated claims are not harmless. Crying wolf when the allegations are unsubstantiated distracts attention from real problems that need real solutions. If we can move beyond the fixation on voter fraud, we will be able to focus on the real changes our elections need, from universal registration all the way down to sufficient parking at the poll site. Moreover, these claims of voter fraud are frequently used to justify policies that do not solve the alleged wrongs, but that could well disenfranchise legitimate voters. Overly restrictive identification requirements for voters at the polls, which address a sort of voter fraud more rare than death by lightning, is only the most prominent example. End quote. In a February segment this year, John Oliver cited just such an example of a heavily exaggerated news story which, upon follow-up, turned out to be nothing but smoke and mirrors. But while reports of zombies voting in South Carolina was amusing, the backstory on this is anything but and shows that attempts in the South to disenfranchise black voters continues to this day despite all work by civil rights activists over the decades. Here's what happened. In 2011, South Carolina was under fire for a new voter ID law passed over the objections of civil rights and voting advocates. The law required that every person have a photo ID of some kind when they vote, showing up at the polls with a valid social security card, a birth certificate, utility bill, or even a voter registration card would not be adequate and you would be shown the door. An Associated Press investigation found that many voters in predominantly black counties in South Carolina don't have such photo identification. For example, Richland County has a total population of 339,000 people, with roughly half of them being white. Of the non-white population, 6% don't have photo IDs. If you follow election results, then you know that 6% of a population is certainly enough to swing a vote one way or the other. As State Democratic Party Chairman Dick Harpultilin said, this is electoral genocide. This is disenfranchising huge groups of people who don't have the money to go get an ID card. Now, when you take away a citizen's right to vote because they can't afford to do it, that is not only unconstitutional, but it also makes it impossible for them to ever be able to influence their own local government so they'll get a chance to climb out of the poverty pit they're stuck in. <laughs> 
And if you think that isn't a problem, consider for a moment how you would react if someone said you couldn't vote unless you were in an upper class income bracket. You'd rightly be infuriated. You'd think someone was trampling all over your rights. But the one thing you wouldn't be able to do is go vote to change it. One point of note is that South Carolina was giving free IDs to those who needed them. But I wonder how broadly this was publicized or known about by those same minorities that needed them. I somehow doubt that most of these people were made aware of this. The U.S. Department of Justice agreed, and they blocked the South Carolina law, stating in a December 2011 letter, quote, Minority registered voters were nearly 20% more likely to lack DMV-issued ID than white registered voters, and thus be effectively disenfranchised by the law's requirements, end quote. Just three weeks later, State Department of Motor Vehicles Director Kevin Schwedo testified before a South Carolina House hearing. He said that he had compared voting records with death records and found 956 discrepancies. As reported in a February 2014 article by website Facing South, quote, Zombie voter hysteria exploded. The same day as Schwedo's testimony, Lou Dobbs at Fox made it a national sensation, claiming that new research shows that more than 900 people, dead people, appeared to have voted in recent elections in South Carolina. Fox News, which had already come to the defense of South Carolina's ID law in early January, went on to invite Wilson on the show to highlight his claims and featured the story again on their straight news program. Back in South Carolina, lawmakers seized on the story as proof of the need for voter ID. Advocates of voting restrictions in states like North Carolina did the same. But South Carolina's screamer of a democracy horror story began to unravel almost as soon as it began. Curiously, when the State Election Commission asked for the list of supposed zombie voters, the Attorney General's office gave them only six names. By early February, the election officials were able to confirm all of the voters were legitimate. Five were very much alive, and one had voted before dying. Clerical errors were blamed. But Fox News was undeterred. In a February 14th dispatch, the network was still reporting that more than 900 votes were, quote, stolen in South Carolina by dead voters. Even as the story lost credibility, South Carolina officials dug in. Analysis of the rest of the cases would surely vindicate their findings. But the opposite happened. The State Election Commission, which had been strangely left out of Schwedo's evidence-gathering process and had questioned the findings from the beginning, <laughs> released a report that was unequivocal in its findings. They said, in 197 of the 207 cases examined, the records show no indication of votes being cast fraudulently in the name of deceased voters. Research found each of these cases to be the result of clerical errors, bad data matching, errors in assigning voter participation, or voters dying after being issued an absentee ballot. In 10 cases, the records were insufficient to make a determination. What about the rest of the cases? As Corey Hutchins of the Columbia Free Times reports, it would take more than a thousand employee hours for the small staff of 15 to investigate them all. Despite the cost, and that the conclusion will likely be the same as before, South Carolina Republicans aren't swayed. As NPR reports, the state attorney general's office in South Carolina said in a statement Thursday afternoon that the question of dead voters is still being investigated by the State Law Enforcement Division, 
and that no final answer to this problem can be determined until that investigation is concluded. End quote. The zombie story finally got a knife in the brain in July 2013 when the Washington Post reported that a 476-page report by the State Law Enforcement Division showed there was not one iota of truth or validity to any dead voters, and that all of them were explained by clerical errors, bad data matching, and the like. What's more, even if all of them had been fraudulently voted, they were a part of a total vote cast of 1.3 million votes, hardly a swaying percentage. This report never would have seen the light of day at all if a certain reporter had not filed a Freedom of Information Act request to get it. There were no press conferences by the governor, no statements by House representatives, or even by the guy in the DMV who had started the whole mess. Had it been left up to them, their lies and exaggerations about the whole matter would have remained in the public record and the impression of rampant voter fraud in South Carolina would have continued to be used to justify taking away people's right to vote. If you dig deeper into these stories, you find the same narrative repeated over and over again across the entire United States. Don't even get me started on Texas, where some of the most discriminatory and blatant voter discrimination in our country happens. But it goes far beyond Texas, 